Right. That's what that that should not have happened. So, so we shouldn't train in an uncontrolled environment. And certainly, when you talk about the streets, uh, public streets, that's not the place where this type of training should be conducted. Now, this is a, a quickly evolving investigation. So I've learned a little bit more since my radio interview. And the one thing I strive to do is to be transparent. This is why yesterday, on the heels of this tragic loss of life, uh, I indicated that the team that he's connected with was involved in a training session, surveillance training. And so, of course, I wasn't prepared to go into a, a lot of details. Uh, we were still very early in our crash invex investigation. What I also reported out was that we have two investigations basically going. We have uh, certainly the fatal crash investigation that is reviewing the causal factors. And then the second part is an internal probe. An internal probe is focusing on uh, the actual training, why it was conducted, how extensive was it. There's still things that I don't know at this point. Again, we're not even 24 hours into the investigation. Uh, but I can tell you preliminarily, uh, we do not authorize training in uncontrolled in, in environments. It's just too risky. And I'm not suggesting that, or do I know at this point, whether or not he was actively involved in surveillance training. It's, there's a couple of beliefs he could have been trying to meet with his team who was actively involved. Uh, I can tell you, as I said to uh, the other station, uh, speed is a factor. We know that now where we are in the investigation. And we know that there was a loss of control of the vehicle. There was an initial strike impact on one vehicle. And it was from that impact uh, that the car the officer was operating when airborne and struck a brick wall. That's why the vehicle was so significantly damaged. It was split in half, as many of you know. Uh, I thought maybe the car struck a metal uh, pylon associated with a train bridge, but as it turns out, it was a brick wall. So control, loss of control, speed. Um, and I'm also told that that area it's probably a, kind of a risky area to be speeding anyway because you can certainly lose sight of traffic signals. So preliminarily, uh, we believe that also uh, the light was red at the time he went through the intersection, thereby striking uh, this other vehicle. Very little damage to the other vehicle, and as I reported yesterday, uh, minimal injury uh, to the occupants. So I just wanted to kind of set the stage around that. And I'll take any specific questions that uh, I may not have ans answered. Um, so, Chief, you've got our condolences then to your department, department for losing Officer Weathers. Thank you. You walked us through a few of those things. What are your questions? you want to know what they were doing out there? Well, you know, question one, uh, I nor the executive team of this department uh, condone training of this nature in an uncontrolled, in a, uh, an environment that's not controlled. When you talk about, you know, the work is already high risk, and some of our training is high risk, but when we engage in high risk training, we always do it in a controlled environment. Uh, in this instance, we're talking about surveillance training, uh, and yes, officers do engage in surveillance in the performance of their duties, but when it comes to training, that should not be conducted in an uncontrolled environment. So uh, we're taking a, a deeper look at that. We want to make sure that it's isolated to this time. Uh, I just don't have a lot of answers as of yet. Again, we are doing a, an internal probe. Uh, and also, I just want to also add that while the team he's connected with, we know there was some surveillance training going on, we are not absolutely certain at the time of the accident that he was connected with the team. It could have been that he was 
proceeding to where the team was located? Uh, not certain yet. Just to clarify, and, and I'm not really familiar with department procedures, but one explanation I've been given, and tell me if this is correct or incorrect, when you talk about surveillance and training in an uncontrolled situation, one scenario I was given is surveillance training means you're chasing what would be, or not even chasing, it's not a pursuit, but you're following a suspect car with at least two unmarked police vehicles with officers in it and talking to each other. You're the suspect, I'm officer one. I follow you for five minutes. Then I say, okay, officer two, get ready to take over. I peel off so that the suspect doesn't get suspicious that he's being followed. Officer two follows. There might be a third officer. But after the peel off, there's a point where officer one has to play catch up. And, you know, and that that's useful. basically, uh, I mean, there's different types of techniques that are used in surveillance, and I certainly won't go into all of them here. Uh, that's certainly what you just described. Uh, clearly, uh, that's the basis of surveillance. Uh, and surveillance is not high speed. Right. Uh, it's not like they're in the process of making an arrest. Even during the training, uh, the training is not high speed. You are surveilling, you are watching. And so uh, in an uncontrolled environment, officers do engage in surveillance, but that's not a training scenario. That's actual police work. But again, I emphasize when it comes to training, uh, the training must be in a controlled environment because the whole, whole idea of training is teaching people how to do the work. Again, I'm not suggesting, and I just want to make one point very clear because we still are very early in this investigation, I can't tell you with certainty that while this officer's team was involved in surveillance training, he may have been trying to meet up with the team, or he could have been actively involved. I'm not certain on that point. But the scenario I gave you fits this incident yesterday? I can't say that. I cannot say what you told me. There are different surveillance techniques. That is one. And that's probably the most basic and common, but there are different uh, types of surveillance, okay. which I don't want to go into for, no, for this session right. for obvious reasons. And they do use different techniques in a training environment. Okay. Uh, before yesterday, what is an uncontrolled setting for this type of training for this department? It's been suggested to me that you'll do this on Bell Isle. You shut down Bell Well, we, we, what we factually do on Belle Isle, we have a driver's training course. It's a secured area, uh, and that's where officers are taught high-speed maneuvers. That's in a controlled part of the park, uh, and that's what I say when I... For surveillance training? They have not, not to my knowledge. So where do you do it before yesterday? I am told there is a location that could be used... There's some things I'm looking at, uh, and I just don't have answers for you right now. I don't want to come off as not being transparent, but there are schools available. In fact, I know that the Michigan State Police have probably one of the better schools, surveillance schools, that teach that sort of thing. It's that. You also have uh, schools outside the state of Michigan. Again, this was a covert, uh, highly specialized unit that does lots of surveillance, and so um, that's where we're at right now. Chief, in the two investigations, is MSP doing the crash investigation? No, we're doing the crash. Our fatal squad, it happened on the streets of Detroit. Our fatal squad, which is common that any time there's a traffic collision involving a fatality, that they actually do the, uh, the investigation but then as a companion investigation, we're doing the probe to look at the whole issue of the training. How many officers are in this specialized squad who do this kind of work? I just can't disclose it right now. And Chief, is, is that uh, police integrity unit, is that part of internal affairs or is that under you? Where is it on the org chart? It's under our professional standards section. 
Chief, we just been informed the mother of Officer Weathers has joined us on Facebook Live. Is there a message for her and the family? Just that uh, we love you, we care for you. We know this is a, a difficult time. Uh, I do understand the pain that you're feeling, and uh, just know that uh, your son uh, will be revered, is being revered as a hero. He not only served uh, in the U.S. Armed Forces in Afghanistan, but in his short time with the Detroit Police Department, he served with distinction. Uh, we should never forget how he responded to Waldus Johnson, an officer who is currently still fighting for his life. But he responded appropriately, uh, courageously, and we believe, and as a testament was, he was awarded the Medal of Valor. And then lastly, and certainly not to be overlooked, is the fact that this officer was phenomenal in working in the community. Uh, certainly there was a video that went viral depicting uh, this fine officer running foot races, uh, bonding with, with young people. And that says a lot of who he was as not only a Detroit police officer, but as a man of integrity and character. Can you tell us a little bit about the uh, other vehicle involved? I just know that it was, the initial impact was with uh, a vehicle, uh, not significant damage, minimal injury to the occupants. Uh, that was the first uh, part of this uh, tragedy. The first contact was with that vehicle that was going in a, a separate di direction. I think they were preparing to make a left turn, so I'm told. Again, I just ask for a little patience. Uh, we are not 24 hours into this investigation. Uh, we have interviews that we must conduct. So some of the questions you're asking me, I can only speculate. And I really don't want to do that. I want to deal with what, what we have as facts today. Is there any uh, dash cam or body cam video of any of this? This was a covert unit, an undercover unit, that uh, those vehicles are not equipped for obvious reasons. They're not equipped with in-car video systems. The officers are undercover, so they're not wearing body-worn cameras. I'm not certain I understand your question other than you want me to, you want me to uh, go through my initial contact. I think uh, this family, like any family, whether it's his mother who I had a com conversation with, his dad, his uncle who is a, a, a Detroit police officer, a neighborhood police officer serving in the 5th Precinct, also his sister. Uh, so let me just say this, the reaction that you would expect. Uh, the thing I heard over and over again from his mother, how good of a man he was, uh, certainly I can say that uh, he touched me personally. I know that um, it was because of his work here in the Detroit Police Department uh, that he was able to land uh, this coveted assignment. I mean, we just don't put anyone in there. We knew about his military background, and he was just so excited and committed serving the people of Detroit. In fact, today is Wednesday. His commanding officer was going to approach me uh, because he wanted to join the major violator section in narcotics. And had he asked me, I would have given him that opportunity because I think that much of him, and I knew he would have done a phenomenal job working in the major violator section. Chief, you've talked about how you have a, a young department here. Um, some people might be surprised to hear about a 25-year-old guy two years in, being put in a unit where you surveil other officers, a lot of whom are going to be older and more veteran than you. Uh, what kind of traits does someone have to have to be that young and in this kind of work? Well, you know, again, we look at background. We have several of the officers that worked at assignment that have former military backgrounds. Uh, I know in the department I came out of, I was assigned to the Internal Affairs Unit for some time in Los Angeles, and we had a coveted integrity type unit uh, and it was not it was routine that uh, many times we would 
pull certain people out of academy classes uh, to join these units for obvious reasons. Typically, they're not well known. Uh, this is not the assignment that you have. It's not a permanent assignment. Uh, certainly, I don't like the idea of people being in assignments like that for long term because it stunts their growth, professional growth, I believe. It's great experience, particularly to those who maybe see themselves uh, uh, wanting to go the investigative route in policing. Chief, uh, the, the incident itself, was this a front and follow type situation where he's maybe following someone? As I indicated, I made a, a very detailed preamble to what I thought you might ask. And so, as I indicated, when Jim Kirshner asked me about the different techniques, well, I'm not going to disclose techniques on how the Detroit Police Department engages in surveillance. Uh, I'm not going to do that. Uh, I've also said to you uh, very specifically, I cannot say today uh, that that officer was actively involved in surveillance. However, we do know that his team was. So was he actively involved or was he trying to join his team that, were, that we do know were at, at a different location? I just don't have that answer yet. Again, I ask you to be patient uh, with this investigation. It's not even been 24 hours. I mean, if you want to continue to talk about this fine officer and what he meant, and the other fine officers that were pinned down by gunfire the night prior. And then let's not f forget about our other hero, Officer Doss. If you want to have further conversation about that, I'm willing to do so. But give us a chance to do a thorough investigation. Chief, will this investigative process include, uh, include or involve the Board of Police Commissioners? I'm not certain. Will they be briefed? We do, our, uh, the Detroit Police Department does criminal investigations. Uh, we do fatal crash investigations. Uh, in terms of a briefing at the conclusion, if that's what you're trying to articulate to me, yes, we will definitely do that. Chief, on uh, social media pages, we received an outpour of love and support for the department. Is there a message for our supporters? Our and, you know, that's, that's a great question. Uh, I, I do want to reiterate that. You know, there's been so much support, you know, from our local politicians, uh, city council, uh, the mayor without, you know, the mayor is always there and supportive. Uh, then we talked about our residents, people who live in the region who reach out, and then the other law enforcement professionals. I'm talking about police chiefs from around this country who have reached out to me directly in the last 24 hours, very appreciative of that, uh, certainly the governor's office, Michigan State Director, Christy Etchu. Uh, this is a, a regular occurrence. Uh, now, there are some who represent this state at the higher offices that I have not heard from, uh, not on this one or prior ones, not directly. Now, that doesn't mean they haven't reached out in their own way, but in terms of our local elected leaders, uh, again, I've heard from the president's office several times in the past uh, as it relates to uh, our fallen heroes. But uh, all in all, we are deeply appreciative of the outpouring of support. Chief, this unit, um, what are some successes you would say the unit has had? Because it's a covert unit and the nature of their work, I'm not going to really go into the details of what they do, when they do it, how they do it. So I'm going to avoid talking about that. What's the difference between this unit and internal affairs? It's a subpart of internal affairs. They, they investigate uh, misconduct, criminal misconduct primarily, primarily, of alleged misconduct of police officers. And at times, sometimes they will investigate other city department, members of other city departments, depending on the type of investigation it is. Just so I am completely clear on your position on this, um, you don't know where this type of training has been done in the past in controlled settings, where they do that, what the standard protocol is, and... 
I don't. I wouldn't say I don't know. I know that we've had members of this department uh, go to the Michigan State Police Surveillance Training School. I'm aware of that. I'm aware of out-of-state schools. Uh, I am. N not that I'm aware, but you know, I'm not certain. If I, it, there may have been training locally, uh, I d I'm just unaware of it. Now, I think what you are, because I've been around you long enough to know when you're, you're starting to do some fishing in a very shallow piece of water, uh, what you're trying to find out if there's a pattern in practice in the Detroit Police Department of this kind of, how can I say, um, surveillance training in um, in uncontrolled environments. When I talk about an uncontrolled environment, that's just simply city streets. Uh, it's only controlled now. What would make it a controlled environment on the city streets if we physically block, shut streets down? And again, typically surveillance training is not high speed. I just want to make that point. Uh, we're not talking about high speed pursuit driving. That's a different type of training. And as I think you pointed out, is that we do do training and have done training on Bell Isle. That's uniformed pursuit type training, high speed driving, which is very different than uh, surveillance training. Very different. I guess what I'm trying to establish is if the protocol of yesterday was broken for this type of training and your investigation well, I can. I think I said preliminarily, you know, that uh, certainly I don't sanction. The executive team didn't sanction surveillance training. I asked the commander over professional standards section if this was approved. He said it was not. Okay, he said it was not. We would not, as an organization, approve surveillance training in an uncontrolled environment and obvious reasons. Even though it typically is a slower speed driving, there's just too many risks involved when you train in uncontrolled environments. You just can't do it. This is why we have facsimiles, uh, we call them situation simulation, where we go in and do tactical training with munitions, where we go in uh, as if we were uh, approaching, say, a barricaded suspect scenario or armed robbery in progress. We do that kind of training uh, in very controlled environments for, again, obvious reasons. Okay, any other questions?